Psalm 103 in your Bibles. Got the introduction to this last week. Psalm 103. Psalm of praise and celebration. First two verses read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. That's what we're doing. David is sort of calling upon his own soul to rise up and bless the Lord. Usually it's the Lord who blesses us, but, but when it's speaks in Scripture of us blessing the Lord. It is us praising Him. It is us extolling His name and lifting Him up. Uh, maybe akin to what we would call worship. Worship the Lord, O oh my soul. And so David is calling upon his soul. Now maybe he was discouraged or distressed at the time. Uh, things weren't going well and he needed to, to get himself back on track and he needed to get his mind instead of wallowing on his problems and dwelling on this and whining and complaining... He needed to, to get his soul back where it ought to be, lifting up his eyes on and lifting up the Lord Jesus. And, and uh, so he calls, bless the Lord, O my soul. And how do you do that? Well, you forget not all his benefits. When you and we tend to forget all of his benefits, all of his dealings with us. We, we are so prone to forget those things. And so that's what he says, forget not all his benefits. And God has given us some things to aid our memories. Because we are so prone to wander, we're prone to forget God, we're prone to forget His Word. He tells us to assemble every Sunday. The Lord's Day here. He says, let me give you one day every week that's my day. So to jog your memory about some things. Be in my house. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, so He's given us the Lord's Day as a, a help to our forgetters. And He's also given us the Lord's Supper as a regular ordinance, hasn't He? He's commanded us to do this in remembrance of me. Remember Christ. Remember His death at Calvary. Uh, so important. And so these are just a couple of things. But, but He says here, forget not all of His benefits. Focus on all the things that God has done for you. Focus on the blessings. Name them one by one. You ever get in a funk? You ever get discouraged, depressed? Then start rehearsing God's blessings. Name them one by one. And uh, that's what he's doing here. He's calling upon his soul to, to praise the Lord. And, and how is he going to do that? He's not going to forget the blessings of God. That God's dealings with him. Well, that's what brought us to today. And uh, what it says in verse 3. And by the way, sometimes we'll cover a chapter or two. Today in the psalm, we're only going to cover a half a verse. <laughs> Who forgives all your iniquities. When it comes to God's dealing with sinful human beings, there is no greater blessing, there is no greater joy, nothing that can stir our hearts up better than that thought right there, that God forgives all of our iniquities. That's it. He starts there because chronologically that's where we start. We're a sinner, undone, separated from God, on our way to hell. Until God forgives our sins. That's the beginning of our Christian life. That's the beginning when we come to Christ. We become a, His child. Become a part of the family of God. We have our sins forgiven. That's first chronologically. But it's also the first and foremost, the most preeminent of all blessings. Can you imagine anything greater for a sinner than to know that his sins are pardoned? Our sins are forgiven. That which separated us from a holy God, our sin. That which separated us from any hope of eternity in heaven with Him, our sin. No, it's all gone now. Pardoned. Forgiven. All of our sin. All of our iniquity. Our perverseness. Our wickedness. Our evil. It's all gone. That is for those who have confessed their sin before God. So we're going to leave this chapter and we're going to go back to chapter 51 of the book of Psalms. Um, psalm 103 is a psalm of David. And so when he makes that statement, who forgives all your iniquities, he's speaking from experience. And Psalm chapter 51 and Psalm chapter 32 are two of the psalms we're going to look at this morning. And uh, 
These are the Psalms in which David confesses his sin to God. And the consequence is that, they, that God forgave all his iniquities. Psalm chapter 51. You'll notice, uh, perhaps in your Bible, there's a little superscription that begins at the beginning of that chapter. And it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So we know that this was a psalm that was written by David after, after his sin with Bathsheba. And I'm assuming also that in, in conjunction with that whole sin was the murder of Uriah. So David was not only an adulterer, he was a liar and a murderer. Bad situation. He committed some horrendous sins. I, don't, I guess you can't get any worse, uh, humanly speaking, than David committed here. And so uh, that's the, uh, the, the occasion of Psalm chapter 51. And uh, this is David's confession. This is his testimony. He says in, in verse 1, he's, he's pleading with God, and he says, Have mercy on me, O God. This is the prayer that every person that comes to God will pray. If they, they understand anything about God, if they understand anything about their sin, it's a prayer, Lord, have mercy on me. We come empty-handed like David did. We're not coming with a boatload of good works saying, Here I am, God, I'm awful good, and i got a whole boatload of good works. So I want you to give me what I deserve. If we did that, you know what that whole boatload of good works would get us? Eternal damnation. Because God says all of our good works, all of our righteousnesses are not There is like filthy rags. And all we would get when we come in our own goodness, we come before God and we say, oh, look how good I am. Look at what I've done for you, God. Give me what I deserve. It would be hell and eternal damnation. No, we come and we plead mercy. Mercy is, Lord, don't give me what I deserve. Lord, out of your kindness and your goodness, your grace, that superabounding grace, that's what I need. I want you to give me what I don't deserve. Forgiveness. It's something that I can't, I can't do. It. I, I, I can't save myself. I can't undo all these sins. I can't pay for these sins. I have a debt that I can't pay. So he pleads mercy. Have mercy on him. It's the same in the New Testament. Remember when Jesus was talking about the publican? And the Pharisee? The publican, the terrible sinner. Well, that Pharisee came in there and he said, Oh God, I thank you. I'm not like anybody else. I'm not a sinner like that. But the sinner, the publican, came in. And he couldn't even lift up his face toward God. He smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God says, that man, the sinner, went home justified before God. Not the Pharisee. We plead mercy. We come to God and say, God, just I've got nothing to offer. Here I am in my rotten, sinful, sinful, wicked state. But I have a broken heart and I'm confessing it to you, God. Be merciful. He says in the next verse. Oh, let me back up just a second here. He not only says have mercy on me, but what does he say? And blot out my transgressions. Yeah, I got a lot of transgressions. I've rebelled against God. I've transgressed His holy laws. I've done things I should have done. I didn't do things I should have done. Every part of my life is transgressions. I'm a sinner, undone, I know that. And I want to blot it out. David didn't want God to just delay or postpone these sins. Uh, let's take these up another day, God. No. Blot them out. I mean, obliterate them, God. Get them out. That's what we need. Because if God doesn't blot them out, we can't deal with them. God, you need to blot them out. And then he says in the next, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. Well, the wash, wash me, that's a, a word that they use for washing clothes. It actually means trample. A wash. And of course, that's what they had to do. They 
Today we have electric washing machines that uh, what a agitate. Okay, the old uh, the pioneer days, they would take them down on the rocks and beat them, uh, or put them in a thing and, and pulverize them somehow. But the idea is David knows that his his uh, iniquity is deeply embedded. He says, I need to be washed. I need to be thoroughly agitated. Not just rinsed to dip a little bit. That doesn't take us in away. David says, I, that sin is so deeply embedded in me. Like when I was a kid, like when you were a kid, you know, and you got those grass stains in your knees and your pants, and your mom said, well, that'll never come out. Well, that's the kind of sin David had. And he says, wash me from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The word cleanse there is a word that's actually used of a leper. And that's why I have Jesus cleansing the leper up here. Did you notice in the New Testament God never healed lepers? He cleansed them. Because leprosy, even though it was a vile sickness disease, it was a picture of man's sinfulness before God in Scripture. It's always Leprosy is always a symbol of sinfulness and corruption. And that's why God cleanses lepers which he heals them in that but it's the idea of taking away the defilement the stench the stink the rot the corruption it was a loathsome disease and it's a picture of our sin and so when David says I don't want to just want to be washed on the outside like you're washing my clothes though I need that too he says cleanse me like a leper he says I got a leprosy of the soul my sin is, is inside. I'm a leper and I need to be morally cleansed. So he's, he, he, David rightfully understands his plight, doesn't he? He's not coming to God thinking he's a pretty good person. He's just a little touching up. He knows that his sin is deeply ingrained and embedded in him and he needs God and God alone to wash him and to cleanse him. And by the way, the washing and cleansing, that doesn't happen by you taking a bath. It doesn't happen by you coming to church and being baptized or dipped or sprinkled either. That doesn't take sin away. No mere water takes sin away. In fact, you can go to partake of the Lord's Supper and you can go to every ritual and, and sacrament and do whatever you want. That's not going to take your sin away. Participation in any bathing or ritual or baptism doesn't take sin away. God does. God is the one in His grace and by the blood of Jesus Christ is able to wash, purge, cleanse away the sin deep down inside. Amen. So, and in fact, that's what he says. uses the word thoroughly. Thoroughly. Inside and out. You see, when a person by the Spirit of God opens his eyes and they realize that they are a sinner, they feel defiled. They feel soiled. They feel dirty. They feel corrupt. And they know they need to be cleansed, washed. And they know that only God can do that. They need to be washed inside and out. That's the work of God. It's the work of God. Verse 3, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. I acknowledge my transgressions. David is acknowledging them here, isn't he? He, he came to grips with them. He's confessing it. Confessing it to God. And by the way, the first step in forgiveness is always confession of sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to come to the point where we acknowledge, admit, confess our sin. Say the same thing about it as God does. That it's wrong. It's sin. We violated His commandments. And that's what David says. I acknowledge my transgression. And then he says, my sin is ever before me. In other words, David's testimony was, this sin is haunting me. It's in my face. It's plaguing me. I'm bearing the burden of it. I can't get away from it. I'm acknowledging it now to you, God. I know I couldn't hide it from you. I can't hide it from myself either. You know, sometimes we, we don't even like to admit we're a sinner ourselves, let alone acknowledge it before God. But forgiveness begins when we acknowledge our sin to ourselves and <laughs> And, 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 and acknowledge it before God. Confess your sin to God. Don't hide it. <laughs> Hidden sin. You go and you say, well, I'm going to try to hide my sin. Well, that's pretty stupid trying to hide it from God anyways, isn't it? 
You think you can really hide your sin from God? It's a joke. No, but if you try to hide it, or refuse to acknowledge it, confess it to God, you go on bearing it. It'll haunt you the rest of your life and it'll haunt you for all eternity. It will be forever with you. Verse 4 says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, he's not saying that I didn't sin against Bathsheba. I didn't sin against Uriah. Surely he did. But the, but the real crime that David understands is, I'm accountable to a holy God. You're the one that's going to give me eternal damnation or eternal blessings. It's before God that I'm accountable. And it's, it's against God that I've sinned. It's against His nature. It's against His holy laws that I've sinned. That's what's going to condemn me for eternity. Against God have I sinned. Same thing that the prodigal son said. Remember, he was sitting there in a pig, pig sw uh, a swine, pig manure, whatever he had there, eating along with the pigs, and finally it came to himself. <laughs> His eyes were opened. And he understood what a sinner he was. And he says, Father, I have sinned. This is what I'm going to go home and tell my father. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Chief sin was against God in heaven. So that's what David says here when he's acknowledging his sins. He's acknowledging, I know it's a sin was outward. It was adultery with Bathsheba. It was against Uriah. He had murdered and the people in his, he had dominion over. He, he was a liar and a cheat and everything else. But his real sin was against God. And he says, uh, the next part of the, that verse, he says that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. In other words, David says, I know I've sinned against you, so when you pass judgment on me, whatever you say, you're right. I stand con condemned. I stand guilty. I deserve whatever punishment you give, Lord, I deserve. I deserve eternal hell. I deserve damnation for what I've done. When, when you speak, Lord, it's right. It's just. I know I've sinned against you. I've done this evil in your sight. He says in verse 5, and he's not passing the blame here. He says, I was brought forth. I was shapen in my mother's womb. I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin my mother conceived me. David says, I did this wickedness. I did it, yes. And in fact, he says, I'm confessing right now that I've been a sinner ever since I was in the womb. This is what we would call a sin nature. That right from conception... A child is born, not only in conception does he become an image bearer of God, not only does he, he become an, a, a true living being, human being, but he also has a sin nature that he receives from dear old mommy and daddy. And so that that little infant, from the time he is conceived and in the womb, he is shaped in iniquity. And therefore, no sooner is he born... And this little child starts demonstrating that sinfulness in his screaming and his rebellion. And the older we get, the more sophisticated and more, well, more complex our sins become and more obvious they become. But, but David says, I've been a sinner ever since. Says, this sin nature that we're born with is what influences us to sin. Every, every single human being other than Christ was born with us without sin, but every one of us was born with a sinful nature. And it influences us and causes us to sin. So we are all sinners, for all have sinned because we were born in sin, had a sin nature. That's what David says. Yeah, I not only sinned, but I've been, I was born in sin. I've been a sinner ever since I was conceived. Verse 6, he says, Lord, I know you desire truth in the inward parts. You desire, and this could mean a couple of things, either you desire truth when I'm confessing my sin. You want this to be a true, heartfelt confession of sin, don't you, God? I remember when I was a kid and I did something and I said something and my mom would say, now you have to say you're sorry to your sister. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you didn't really mean it, did you? Nope. <laughs> well, God, when we confess our sins, He desires truth. 
When we can come to God and confess our sins, He wants a true, sincere, heartfelt confession. We really believe it. We've sinned against God and we're worthy of any punishment He has. Or it could mean that, God, I know You desire truth in the inward parts. That's not in my inward being, my soul. You desire truth. But David, what's his testimony? I've been harboring, I've been harboring corruption and wickedness in my heart. Remember, David didn't confess for quite a while. He kept putting it off, and, and God was bringing conviction that sin was ever before him and haunting him. It took him a long time before he confessed. He was harboring wickedness and corruption and adultery and murder in his heart. But he knows that God wants truth there. And in the hidden, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Remember in the Old Testament, the, the opposite of wisdom is what? Folly. Wisdom and folly. It's, it's righteousness and sin. And God, David says, I, I, need, I need heavenly wisdom, saving wisdom. I need, I need purity. I need truth in there. Not the wickedness that I have in there now. You've got to put that in there, Lord. You need to change my heart. You notice also here the emphasis on the inner the inward parts and the hidden part. <laughs> David knows that sin begins in the heart. His sin with the Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah, yes, those were outward things that he committed against people, literally, outwardly in the flesh. He did that. But where does all sin begin? Right in the heart. That's where all anger, impatience, envy, murders, it all starts right in the heart. That's why Jesus, when He came in the New Testament, He was explaining this. He said, if you even look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If you're angry with your brother, you say to him, Rekha, you blockhead, you fool, you call your brother something like that in anger. Where did that come from? That's murder, He said. It's the same sin as murder. It starts in the heart. All sin starts in the heart. That's what David says here when he talks about this hidden parts, the inward desires. God, I need to be saved from the inside out. We say, well, obviously we need, you know, we need our heart. We need to be regenerated. We need to be born anew. We need a new heart, a clean heart. A lot of churches don't understand that. A lot of churches, you know, try to conform people from the outside in. God always works from the inside out. He's concerned with your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. David understood that. We need work in the heart, don't we? That's where it starts. Now, many churches have a lot of rules and regulations. And, oh, Christian, you got to do this. You got to dress like this. You got to, you know. And they got all these rules, and they're trying to conform people to look like Christians on the outside, and they forget that no, God does the work on the inside out. Maybe as they mature and grow, and then those things will be evident in their life. But, but we can't make people outwardly conform until God does His work in the heart. And then those things will naturally mature and be the fruit. So we teach and preach and pray that God works through His Word, through His Spirit, in the inner man. And then as we mature and grow in the Lord, then all those outward things take care of themselves. And in the meanwhile, we don't sit around and judge how a person looks or how they dress. God is working on the inside, and eventually it will come on the out. He says here, uh, purge me, in verse 7, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Anybody grow hyssop? I don't, I don't know if it grows here in our country or not, but he says, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was a, uh, a flowery, leafy uh, piece of vegetation they had over in Israel. Uh, hyssop was something they used in the cleansing of the lepers. Uh, in Leviticus 14, you, were, you know, a person wanted to be cleansed of a leper, they had to bring two living and clean birds, a piece of cedar wood, some scarlet, and the hyssop. And the priest then would kill the one bird, and then he would strap the bird and the hyssop and the scarlet onto the piece of cedar wood, and he would dip the tail feathers and the hyssop and the blood and use that, the sprinkling of the blood 
in the ceremonial cleansing of the leper. It was obviously God who did the cleansing inwardly, but the, the Old Testament, the process here was this sprinkling. And, and that's what David is. He's using that analogy. He says, oh, God, I want you to take the, the hyssop and dip it in the blood of the lamb and sprinkle me clean. I want you to declare me clean. Just like the priesthood had to go through this so that they could declare a person clean. God, he says, I want you to take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle me clean. So that's what that purge me with hyssop. He's talking about and I shall be clean. You, Lord, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He talked about that purging and washing before and the cleansing. But it's always, God, you have to do this. You purge me. You wash me. I can't wash myself. I can't undo this sin. I can't pay the debt. You have to do it, God. And so that's what he says. He says, you purge me. You wash me. Trample me. And in fact, this word trample, wash, it's what the fullers did. Probably some of you older folk heard of Fuller's soap. A Fuller was a, not only a soap maker, uh, but Fuller's were, that was a dirty, dirty job. Fuller's worked uh, with the sheep shears. And so when they sheared the sheep, that dirty, stenchy, stinky sheep wool had to be somehow cleansed, cleaned. And so the fullers would take it and put it in these vats and either use big sticks to pound it uh, or various techniques. They'd get in with their own feet and be trampling it, washing it. Uh, but they would also have their extremely harsh soaps that they would use to somehow, probably like our Clorox, and bleach somehow to bleach the wool so it would be white. So. That's what a fuller did. And, and that's what David says. David's saying to God. He says, I want you to take me, my, my rotten, sinful, dirty wool of a soul, and put it in a vat and trample it, wash it, and make it white as snow, glistening. Not only prays for that, but it's exactly what God does when he saves us. There's no stains left. There's no blotches. Not like when you were in third grade, you remember, with those old big pencils and the big erasers. And after like four or five mistakes and you got all these great big blotches, you thought you corrected it, but the teacher could tell. <laughs> no, whiter than snow. That's what he wanted. Verse 8, he says, make my bones... Make my bones. Yeah. David, under, when he was under the uh, conviction of God, he ate. He hurt. It affected his whole body. His whole being was lacking the joy and gladness. And so now he says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. It's one of the great blessings of being forgiven by God. When you come to God and you acknowledge your sin, you confess your sin to God, and He washes you, He purges you, He cleanses you from every stain, you know what else happens as a side effect? An overwhelming joy. When you are cleansed and the burden, is, uh, the, burden the, the guilt, the sin, the damnation is lifted off of you, every stain is cleansed, and you're made white as snow, wow. There's joy. There's rejoicing. There's gladness. You were once an alien from God and now you are at peace with God. You are reconciled to God. You're part of His family now. You're a son, a daughter of God's family. There's joy and gladness. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins. Hide your face from my... David had probably come to the conclusion he, he'd been hiding his own sin, but he couldn't hide it from God. And since I can't hide my sin from you, God, he says, I want you to hide your face from me, from my sin. And while you're doing that, in other words, God, cover your eyes, because I know that you are a holy God of purity, of 
holy, 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 the thrice holy God. I know you're a pure eyes to behold iniquity. Lord, cover your eyes, hide your face from me, and at the same time, blot out my sin. I know you can't even look at me in my sinfulness. David obviously realized how sickening and defiled his own sin was to himself at this point. I can't believe I've done this. You probably experienced that yourself. Lord, how could I have done this? I feel so rotten, so vile, so wicked, so sinful. How could I have done this? And you wish that somehow God would hide his faith. Somehow God could take that divine record and just expunge it as if I had never done that. That's exactly what David did. He's going to God and saying, God, I want my record cleansed, expunged. Blotted out. It's the same thing you said back in verse 1. Remember, according to your multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Yeah, but notice what he's saying here now. He's adding something. He says, blot out all, all my iniquities. Maybe I've committed some more sins since then. Maybe some I'm not even aware of. But Lord, I need you to eradicate, obliterate, wipe out, blot out forever. All, all my iniquities. Wow. Verse 10, he says, create me a clean heart. And only one, only that sin, I, Lord, I need you to do a work in my heart. I want you to put in my heart the desire to do right. And so he says, create me a clean heart. By the way, that's the same word create as in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created He's calling upon Almighty God to recreate in Him a, a clean heart, a new heart. Renew a steadfast or a right spirit within me. He's not praying for the Holy Spirit to come into Him. He's praying for His own spirit to be made right. I've been deceiving. I've been covering up. I've been murdering. I've been adultering. I've been lying. I need you to make me all right, God. This, this renewing is, takes place at, when God regenerates us and makes us His child. He makes our spirit right, a, 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 a new spirit within us. So that's David's confession. And what he's asking, he's explaining to God, he's acknowledging his sin to God, isn't he? And let's go back to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And this is what David says there. And now this is past tense. He has now been forgiven by God, having acknowledged it, and he says, blessed. Oh, wow, happy. Blessed is that man. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old. This is reference to his bones, his achy bones. He says, they grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. For a long time, David was under the conviction of God. The Spirit of God was convicting him of sin, but he would not acknowledge it. He wouldn't confess it. And it, it, it took a toll on David, on his body. And he wouldn't confess his sin to God. And then finally, verse 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. So we just studied in chapter 51. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity have I not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And look at that great statement. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You forgave me. A murderer, an adulterer, a deceiver, a liar. I came to you and I pleaded mercy and I confessed my sin. And just as simple as that, and you forgave me. Isn't that a great blessing? It doesn't get any better than that. So when we go back to Psalm 103, and David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Has first and foremost on David's mind. 
It's the first and foremost, most important blessing any human being can ever experience. To be forgiven of all of our iniquities. This isn't just a theological truth. We have to put it into practice. Having been forgiven by God, you need to forgive yourself. Some people struggle with that. They go to God with their sin and God forgives. And they walk around with it then for months and months and years. No. If God has forgiven your sin, blotted it out, cast it behind His back, promised to never remember it again, separated it as far as the east is from the west, you have no right to ever drag it back or to carry it around. In fact, it's not only a pointless endeavor, it's a dangerous and sinful endeavor for you to be bearing the guilt of sin that is already forgiven. I believe just as much as the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin and brings a consciousness of your sin until you confess it, after you confess it and have been forgiven, if you are still thinking about it, dwelling on it, feeling the guilt of it, that's the devil. That is Satan accusing you of sin that Christ has already paid for and dealt with. You don't have a right to dig up what God has buried. You don't have a right to try to rewrite the divine record that God has expunged. God has dealt with it. Don't you dare try to write it back in there. When God forgives your sins, you bless the Lord. Don't carry it around. Don't dwell on it. Don't think on it. And when those thoughts come back and haunt you about past sin that's been forgiven, you just say, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to think about that. That's, that's Satan accusing me. That's Satan's work. I've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the almighty grace of God. I'm not going back there. So you forgive yourself. The second part of that is you forgive others. Ephesians 4.29 says, And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. When God has forgiven another one of our brothers their sin, you don't have a right to hold it against them either. That has been forgiven. They have confessed that to God. It's been forgiven by God. It's been dealt with. And you have no business holding that up or bringing that back up to them. It's been done, dealt with, gone. We forgive others. It's my little sister Debbie and my older sister Mary Ellen. Yes, that's me there. <laughs> I was forgiven of all my trespasses, all my iniquities, all my sins when I was about five years old. I knelt down in the front window with Mary Ellen and my mom, and in a childlike faith, I knew I was a sinner. And I asked the Lord Jesus to be my Savior and take my sin away. And that day I was forgiven all my iniquities. Well, how many did I have? <laughs> Not many. At least I didn't think. And so I went for many years almost embarrassed about my Christian testimony. I had friends that, oh, they'd had a mess of their life. They'd grown up on the streets. They were drug addicts. They were alcoholics. They... Uh, they were in prison two different times for armed robbery. And, and God miraculously saved them out of a life of sin and debauchery and made them a new person. It's a, it's a real exciting testimony when you hear what God can do. And they say, well, how about you, Tim? How, what's your salvation testimony? I go, well, I was... I was saved and born and that's <laughs> it. Not much to say. I was raised in a Christian family. Went to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, every Wednesday night from the time I was about 12 days old. 
and didn't have a lot of outward, overt, wicked lifestyle. Now, I disobeyed mom and dad plenty, I'm sure of that. But, you know, nothing real serious like murder or adultery or anything. I wasn't a drug addict. So I never thought my testimony was that great. But you know what? <coughs> when God saved me, he forgave all of my iniquities. Amen. Past, present, and future. They were all nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so the longer I live, the accumulating sins of the past 64 years have been forgiven. My testimony is getting greater and greater. Every wicked thought that ever passed through this heart of impatience and envy and murder and strife and division and adultery or whatever any wicked thought ever came up in this heart has been forgiven by God. And my testimony is just as great as King David's. He forgave all of my iniquity. Because if any of them are not paid for and not forgiven by the blood of Christ, then I'm going to have to go to hell someday and pay for them. If they're not. When he made me a child of God, they are forgiven. All of them. Wow. I do have a great testimony. He saved me from a life of debauchery. He saved me from every one of those sins. He expunged every bit of it from my record. And in heaven, God says justified. We're justified. I've declared righteous in God's sight. My record has been expunged. Not just sealed so other people can't see it. It's been expunged, obliterated. Next Sunday, I'll give you an opportunity to share your salvation testimony. Not the long version, not the half hour version. Some of you have some real long testimonies. But if you want a 15 or 20 second testimony to share how God forgave all your iniquities, maybe a two minute, I don't know, but a, but a brief salvation testimony about how God forgave your sin. We want to hear that next Sunday. Heavenly Father, this is no doubt the greatest truth that anybody could ever experience. I've experienced it. And most people here this morning know of your great grace. They know of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. They know that you forgive sins to those who come to you can confess. You have mercy. You're a God of grace and loving kindness. And you save those who come to you with a true heart. And Father, our desire my plea would be that if there's anybody here this morning that is not absolutely sure that, they're a, that they've been saved, that their sins have been forgiven, that they would right now in their heart, not outwardly, it doesn't matter, but in their heart, it's between them and God, that they, would be, that they would acknowledge their sin before you, Lord, and plead mercy, and that you would save them, make them your child, and forgive all their iniquities. And then, Lord, as we are dismissed, that we go home and rejoice, that we would indeed, our souls would bless you throughout this week. And that we would not be forgetful of all your blessings and benefits to us, and especially this one, that you forgave all of our iniquities. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and we're going to sing number 200, My Sins Are Blotted Out, I Know. You can sing that. Stand with me, please.
Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for the, to be gathered with the family of Christ, Lord. Hearing your words, teaching us what what the, what the, the way that you would have us to knowing that our sins are forgiven, and that uh, once saved and forgiven, that they're in the past and they're gone, and we don't need not bring them up again. We thank you, Lord, for this tremendous gift you have to us. Walk with us this day, Lord, we pray and carry us in the same. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.